Again, my name is Richard Fisher. I had a long career at the Workers' Compensation Court. I was in a regulatory position. Uh, we regulated self-insured employers, third-party administrators, self-insured groups. We maintain a workers' comp database of all the insurers in the state of Oklahoma. The workers' compensation is coming up on its 100th anniversary in Oklahoma. It was formed in 1915 to create what was, we like to call a grand bargain, and that's where employees have guaranteed benefits no, through no fault of their own. It's no fault insurance for indemnity, medical benefits, and death benefits, so they were covered on any on-the-job accident, doesn't matter if they were contributing to the negligence or not, and in exchange for that, employers could not be sued in district court for negligence, so they had a more manageable um, way to control their risk rather than, well, we win 90% of the cases, but 10% of them, wow, they're doozy. So it was a way to control the cost, and it was called the grand bargain. And it, back in 1915, it was called the State Industrial Commission, and it, was, it stayed that way until 1959, in which the Industrial Commission became the State Industrial Court. And then from and that state, at the State Industrial Court until 1978, where it changed to the Workers' Compensation Court, and, until, and it stayed that way until 2014, and now we have a Workers' Compensation Commission. So all the talk about, well, we have to have a commission to solve our problems, we actually used to have a commission, and we've just kind of gone back to the future on that. Next few slides will illustrate what's happened in Oklahoma recently and why this bargain had to be fixed. What we have here, it's the average voluntary loss cost per the NCCI. The NCCI, for, for those of you that don't know, is the National Council on Compensation Insurance. And it's a third party that basically suggests workers' compensation rates, what needs to be charged by insurance companies in the state of Oklahoma. And these these numbers actually correspond to dollars, and so that 213 for Oklahoma is two dollars and thirteen cents for every one hundred dollars of payroll. You could look at it like that. And so Oklahoma's average loss, that's everybody's clerical, roofing, trucking, manufacturing, restaurant, all the rates blended together. And in Oklahoma, the average loss cost for one hundred dollars is two dollars and thirteen cents in two thousand thirteen. Now compare this to Arkansas, where those same rates, the same blends of in industries, is at 75 cents. Texas was at 65 cents for every $100, $100 of payroll. The regional average was 93 cents. And the countrywide average, which includes liberal workers' compensation states like California and, the, and in the Northeast, was only $1.41. So Oklahoma was just doing horrible in workers' compensation, so something had to change. Now, ever since I was at the workers' comp court, the legislature has always focused on workers' compensation reform. It was a hot topic every year, and you guys know that. Um, and they've done some good jobs with a lot of their changes. But what they managed to do was not make a dent in our comparison to other states, but they managed to keep inflation at bay. They, kept the, they managed to keep it a stable system. For example, the 8810 classification code, which everybody has, it's the clerical code. In 2002, your average cost for every $100 of payroll for a clerical worker was $0.35 cents for every $100 of payroll. And after 10 years of workers' comp reform in, in 2012, the average cost for that same rate was $0.36. Cents. So we had a stable system. They kept it from going up, but they didn't, do any, they didn't manage to do anything about it go, making it go down. Well, how does this new clerical rate compare to other states? Um, here's the clerical rate in 2012. Uh, as of 1 1 2013, in Oklahoma it's 36 cents for every $100 of payroll. And Oklahoma and Texas were both only at 11 cents for the exact same work. There's no difference in what a clerical person does in Oklahoma versus Texas and Arkansas. The exact same work is over three times as high. And the legislature said, okay, that's enough. You know, this, we're put at a competitive disadvantage with other states. People doing the exact same work, Oklahomans are having to pay. Um, three times as much in some cases for workers' compensation insurance. So when they're trying to figure out, you know, okay, what caused Oklahoma's rates to be so high? What are, what are the problems? What could we focus on to fix this issue? Well, when I started to, as, in my career as the director of insurance the, in 1992, I went back and found that there was almost 25,000 Form 3 filings at the workers' compensation court. 
A Form 3, for, for those of you that don't know, it's the lawsuit, basically, that an employee fi files against their employer claiming workers' compensation benefits. It means that they've litigated the case, it wasn't, it wasn't able to be resolved amicably, and they wanted a judge to resolve the issue. And that was probably the, that was close to the high water mark over the past 25 years. Through focus on safety and reduction in litigation, this is stuff that employers have done. This is not stuff that, you know, was mandated. Employers said, we've had enough. We've got to do something to fix this. So they focused on preventing the injuries. They focused on um, making sure that cases were resolved amicably and didn't force people to go to the workers' compensation court. They've been able to get these workers' compensation claims down to under 15,000 in 2012. So that trend proves that just the number of litigated claim filings isn't the problem. A lot of the talk about workers' compensation costs likes to focus on the court versus the commission. The court is a, is a judicial system. It's litigious in nature, obviously. It's a court. And um, you have judges that resolve cases. So we went, I went back and looked in 2002 because there's been a lot of complaints about liberal judges. So I go, well, maybe there's some proof behind that, and maybe the legislature's looking at the same stuff. So I went back and looked at, in 2002, the average PPD award, and again, a PPD award is a permanent partial disability award, and you get one of those if you're hurt on the job and you suffer a permanent impairment. For example, you have a surgery, and there's the award for that surgery is, is could be determined by charts and benefit tables, but most of the time it's, re it's determined by a judge on what the actual percentage is. And the percentages then equate to dollar amounts based on the severity of the injury and the type of injury. Those awards in 2002 were $14,112. However, in just 10 short years later, those average awards for PPD <coughs> claims jumped to over $34,000, almost a, two and a half times an increase in workers' compensation awards for the PPD portion. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but how, does, how do these PPD awards compare in number to other states? Not just the amount, but what about the number of PPD awards? Now, this is different than the total amount of claims, which includes, you know, TTD and compensability issues. These are just PPD awards or PPD claims. In Oklahoma, and uh, this is based on 2009 filings from the NCCI. We had 845 PPD claims for every 100,000 workers, compared to 233 for Arkansas and 343 for Texas. Now, I don't think there's uh, people in Oklahoma are doing anything different work-wise than people in Arkansas and people in Texas. So obviously, there this is too easy to get a PPD award in Oklahoma. It's too lucrative. And so some, a, lot, a lot of people actually went ahead and filed for PPD claims when they didn't do that in Oklahoma, Texas. So Oklahoma has a PPD problem. If you can look at the stuff between the surrounding states, we have a lot higher awards. We have more PPD claims, and the, and the PPD awards have skyrocketed. So that's what the legislature decided to fix once and for all in their 2013 legislation called Senate Bill 1062. Now, in 1062, what they focused on mainly was doing away with the Workers' Compensation Court and forming a new Workers' Compensation Commission, basically changing from a judicial system to an administrative e executive branch agency. Well, they did both. For any claims prior to 2-1-2014, there's still a workers' compensation court. Its name has changed to the Court of Existing Claims, but all those old claims that were, that were incurred prior to 2-1-14 are still under the old law and will still be heard if it goes to trial by workers' compensation judges. For any claims after 2-1-2014, however, we have a new workers' compensation commission, which is an administrative uh, agency, it's part, it's under the executive branch of the government, not the judicial branch. And the people that run the, the Workers' Compensation Commission are uh, three commissioners. They're appointed by the governor. They're appointed to run the system, and they serve, initially serve staggered terms of six, four, and two years, but eventually they'll all be on six-year terms. I know all three of the commissioners. I've worked with them all. And I can tell you unequivocally that they're business-oriented people. They were appointed and their direction is to basically reduce the workers' compensation cost to the employers in the state of Oklahoma to get it more in line with, with surrounding states. 
the new commissioners are. The chairman, and he was on board first, his name is Troy Wilson. He's a retired banker from Kansas. His time in Oklahoma was spent managing the Xerox plant over there, I think, on I-40 by Yukon. He's been there the longest, and he, was work he worked a lot with existing court staff, including the, the former court administrator, Michael Klingman, to try to get this thing up and running as quickly as possible. As you guys know, the law went into effect, well, it was passed in, in 2013, but it didn't go into effect until February 2014, but there really wasn't any time, any budget, any staff, anybody to get this thing up and running. But he was brought on board, and the fact that it's actually up and running now is actually uh, semi-miracle. They did a good job. The second commissioner appointed is Denise Engel. She was the assistant uh, deputy director, I believe, at the insurance commissioner's office under Commissioner Doak. She was in charge of workers' compensation over there, and she was brought over. She has the most experience in workers' compensation. And the third commissioner is Robert Gilliland. He's uh, an attorney. He wasn't a workers' compensation attorney, but he brings the, the legal aspect and legal expertise to the commission. Now, the previous court administrator, Michael Klingman, has been replaced by an executive director, Dr. Rick Farmer. He also is at the insurance commissioner under Commissioner Doak, and his job is to run the day-to-day -day operations of the commission. Now, to get this thing up and running, the commission had to establish rules and procedures and forms, and to do that in just a short amount of time is a near impossibility with a brand new agency. So what they did is that they copied a lot of this from the state of Arkansas. Arkansas, as you saw earlier, had you know, a lot lower rates in Oklahoma. So they tried to model their rules, forms, procedures on the state of Arkansas. So they took a lot of that and then basically just put Oklahoma instead of Arkansas on a lot of the information. So it was, it's actually worked to help speed the process along and get the commission up and running. The, the commissioners will hire administrative law judges to hear disputes. The ALJs do not serve a term and can be replaced by the commissioners. This, I want to accentuate this point. The old workers' compensation system had workers' compensation judges that were appointed and they served a long term, I think eight years, and once they were in, they were in, and if they were doing damage, if they were giving liberal awards or conservative awards, dependent on your perspective, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. They were free agents. They could, you know, a lot of people that, that were thought to be conservative ter turned out to be claimant advocates. A lot of people that were thought to be claimants advocates, you know, moved towards the middle some. But as a whole, you had, dependent on who the governor was at the time and, and if they had a chance to make any workers' compensation changes to the, to the judgeship, you could have um, a lot of liberal judges mixed in with a lot of conservative judges. But these administrative law judges, they're employees of the commission. They are not, they do not serve a term. They can't stay in there for eight years. So if their if they're decisions that they make on compensability or if they're giving high PPD awards, um, the commissioners who are business oriented, they could fire these ALJs. I mean, if they say you got, you're, you're being too liberal with your interpretation of the law, we don't like your decisions, you know, you're out the door. So that in itself is one of the biggest changes in the workers' compensation law. You've replaced eight-year judges, with employees, they're judges still, but they're, it's a different type of hearing. But these judges could be replaced if they're if they don't do exactly what the commissioners want them to do. The ALJs are the primary hearing officers of the commission, and this is starting to take place as we speak. Their focus is on getting speedy resolution of claims and disputes. A lot of this law was focused on saving money for the business owners, and rightfully so. And, um, but there had to be something in there for the injured worker too. And too many times in the past, it takes too long for an injured worker to navigate through the system. It takes them a long time to get a hearing. Everything gets drawn out. They, um, they want to focus on, okay, insurance companies, employers, employees, everybody, let's get this thing together. Let's get the medical. Let's get this thing resolved. If there's a dispute, let's get that hearing done as soon as possible. Let's get it resolved. Let's get you back to work as quickly as possible. And that's what the ALJs and the commission as a whole are, all, are focusing on as a benefit to the injured worker. If there's any appeals of any of the decisions from the ALJs, the three commissioners will serve as the appeal process. In the past, for the workers' compensation court claims, the appeal process was heard by three 
three judges called a court and bank. This will be called a commission and bank, and the three commissioners will hear any appeals. And since they're business-oriented, you know, commissioners, I don't think that they'll re-adjudicate the cases, but if the hearing is basically in line with whatever the procedure and law states, I don't think that they'll make many changes. A big focus on Senate Bill 1062 was the reduction in litigation. So we've already, we, okay, we've changed from the judges to administrative law judges. We've changed from three commissioners running the show from an administrator. And now the focus is on, okay, what could be done to reduce litigation? There, no attorney fee if the claim is not controverted. Controverted means denied. You could reduce litigation by, by keeping the, by not denying the claim and by, um, if they, and get the focus on, okay, we admit the claim, get the medical paid, here's your weekly benefits, get them back to work. Attorneys can't get involved in those cases. The um, commission wants to use an expanded counselor's department to offer assistance to help guide claimant through the system and keep the claim from being litigated. This, what, this is a pretty important step in the whole process. The, um, we haven't seen it yet, but we do believe that as the commission gets more funding, they're going to hire a lot more counselors, which you could co consider advocates um, for the claimant. If a claimant is hurt, hurt uh, injured worker is hurt on the job, and they don't know where to go, they could. They'll obviously the employee employer will file a notice of injury with the commission. The commission gets that. They see that there's been an injury, and then they'll contact the claimant. They'll send them a letter saying we are here to offer our services to help you th navigate through the system without the need of hiring an attorney. So they could serve as an advocate. They could try to resolve some disputes. They go well. Maybe some mediation will help resolve this issue. So they want to focus on getting this thing resolved as quickly, keep the attorneys out of the system. This third part is pretty important. If a settlement offer is made, meaning that, and it's turned down, say somebody had surgery and, and on their knee and they were offered a 10% impairment rating and I don't know what the exact amount is. Let's say it's a $10,000 award for, P, for the PPD award. If they turn it down because some attorney says, you know what, I think we could get a $50,000 award at the commission. Let's go take our chances with the hearing. If they turn that down in writing, then it goes to hearing. And if the, but the claimant's attorney could only receive 30% of the difference in the amount awarded versus the amount offered. So if the ALJ says, no, this is just a $15,000 um, award, the attorney only gets 30% of that $5,000 difference between what eventually was awarded versus what was offered. So that probably will, will limit the influence of a claimant's attorneys taking what appears to be a cut and dry case and bringing it to a, what used to be the court, now the commission, to try to receive a large settlement because they might have you know, got the luck of the draw and got a liberal judge. They go, well, we could get 50000 I think those days are gone. The Senate Bill 1062 uh, focused on uh, reducing medical benefits um, in the following ways. This top part is very important. I mean, it's not that much different than what it was in the past, but it, the, the number of days changed from seven to five. The employer gets to select the treating physician but must provide treatment within five days of notice of injury. This is very important. If you, could, if you could get them their treatment within five days of notice of injury, you get to control the medical. That means that you get to select the treating physician. They will, they, will, they will direct the medical procedures, what's needed, what's necessary. If the employee selects their own doctor, chances are they're going to get a lot more, you're going to get a lot more treatment, a lot longer disability periods. You might have some additional body parts injured. So if they turn down the treatment, they go, well, I'm fine. I don't need anything get it in writing, offer the treatment in writing, have them decline it because if they come back later on and go, you know what, it, it's starting to bother me now, you still control the right to control the treating physician if you got that denial of them wanting medical treatment in writing. Only one change of this physician is allowed, a treating physician, and the employer insurance carrier gets to, they provide a list of three physicians and the employee selects from the list in the past, the em employer insurance carrier would provide three employers, if they, um, doc, excuse me, doctors, if they wanted to change physicians, and the employee would provide three. So obviously you're going to have dueling doctors, and the the court would decide if they couldn't, you know, come up with a compromise. 
but right now the employer slash insurance carrier gets to provide the list. The claimant doesn't get to provide their own list. I could tell you that employers aren't going to, as a TPA, we're not going to provide a, a list of doctors that have bad outcomes. We have the statistics that, sh that show, look, this doctor has gotten these people back to work, back injuries, they've been successful on their surgeries, they've gotten them back to work, they've done a good job so they don't have much impairment. And um, those are the kind of people that will be on the list. It's not going to be goofballs that deny everything because if you deny everything, you're just going to increase the, the litigation, increase the time of fighting to try to, for them to get their treatment. So we're going to put good, solid, conservative doctors that have a very good track record on that list, but the employee has to pick one from that list. Um, this next part, I mentioned earlier about trying to speed the process along. Um, I'm sure you probably all have some examples of injured workers that are off on temporary total disability and they keep missing medical appointments because they really don't want to come back to work. Um, this new part in here, if an injured worker misses two medical appointments not caused by extraordinary circumstances, he she will no longer be eligible to receive benefits under the Act inability to get transportation is not a valid excuse. So if they're malingering and not going to their doctor's appointments to get treatment, you could, we, could, we could just cut them off from their, from their weekly benefits. So this hopefully will get them, get their treatment, get them back to work as soon as possible. And the legislature believes, and rightfully so, that the quicker that they receive medical treatment, the more, the, the more that they follow the treatment guidelines and plans from the treating physician, the better the outcomes will be. And outcomes meaning that they will have less di disability, less time off, less need for surgeries and things like that. The indemnity benefits, um, which are called TTD, which is temporary total disability, um, that those are wage replacement benefits for injured workers where you're hurt on the job and you can no longer actually do your job, so you're at home. and. Um, it pays you, in some cases, if you're a high wage worker, you're not getting close to what you were, but if you're a low wage worker, you'd probably get close to what you were making. The way that the TTD benefits work is that you get paid 70% um, of your average weekly wage, but it can't exceed the state's average weekly wage. And that has actually been reduced from a max of $801 a week down to um, $561 a week. The TTD has been reduced. The second part is, is pretty important. It's been, it's been reduced from a max of three years down to a max of two years. So that means it still seems like a long time to be off and not been able to work, but you know, you're, you're basically these are tangible changes to the workers' compensation structure that actually reduce, that will result in workers' compensation um, premium reductions. The actuaries at the NCCI basically looked at this and go, okay, well, we could see that, you know, 30% of claimants are off three years on TTD and it costs this much more money. We now know that if they're only off two years, we could slice 3% off the workers' compensation rates. They also know that, that changing the max TTD rate from 801 down to 561, they could tangibly say, okay, well, this is going to res result in another 4% reduction in your workers' compensation costs. So those top two things are, are tangible benefits that help the injured, not the injured worker, but the employer. Uh, this last change, it's gone back to the way that it used to be a long time ago, which, where TTD is payable after three days lost time. It was previously retroactive to, to day one if you're off more than 21 days, but you didn't receive it until you were off seven days, so that was pretty convoluted. This is actually a lot simpler. If you miss more than three days, you're eligible for TTD but it's not retroactive back to day one. And as I mentioned before, Oklahoma has a PPD problem. When the legislature decided to fix this PPD problem, they didn't take a scalpel and s operate surgically on it. They basically just took a machete and started chopping it up. They really did some really, some really serious work on this PPD issue. The PPD is, as I mentioned, permanent partial disability, and the allowable PPD, PPD was reduced by over 30 percent by changing the maximum allowed from 500 weeks to 350 weeks. So if you receive an impairment, there's a chart that says, okay, you're eligible to receive this dollar figure for so many weeks and that's paid out to you on a weekly basis. And 
it used to be on bodies of whole injuries, you could receive a PBD check for, for 500 weeks. And um, that's changed to 350 weeks. And so what that means is that you're going to get, in person that has a PBD award is going to receive, you know, simply 30% less on, the, on their settlements. Um, the second part, though, is, the, is the, probably the biggest section on, in the new law as far as controversy, but that, all, that could both have the greatest benefit to the employers in the state of Oklahoma, but it's probably sure to be challenged eventually in the Supreme Court. If you don't lose your job, you, d you don't get a PPD award. And what that means is that um, I'm, trying, I'm probably putting thoughts and words in the legislature's mind, minds, but what I think that they're trying to say is that if you're able to come back to your job and do the exact same work, you did not suffer an economic impairment from your on-the-job injury. You're doing the exact same thing. You're not suffering a job loss. You're not suffering the ability to do your job, so therefore you are not eligible for any type of um, impairment payment. And so if somebody's hurt, they have surgery, they've reached maximum medical improvement, uh, and ALJ basically says, okay, you get 15% impairment, but if they come back to work, um, that PPD amount will be set aside and reduced each week, and it's based on a schedule of reduction, but eventually, within a year or two, that PPD amount that you owe the injured worker will, will go down to zero. So if they stay on their job doing the same pay, it doesn't have to be exactly the same work, but it has to be the same pay, um, they won't receive their PPD award. So that, as you could tell, those $34,000 average PPD settlements people, and you probably know this, you probably have people that are working this with you that came back, got the exact same job, seemed to be fine, doctors did a good job, but yet they, ha they get a big huge settlement, they go buy a new car, new boat, whatever it is they happen to do, people tend to spend those, that $35,000 check rather than setting it aside, you know, for future medical, which is what they should do, because once you get a settlement, the case is closed, you should set that money aside in case you have future pain and suffering or you can't do your job five years down the road, but instead they spend it all at once. Those, those, those big settlements are going away under this new provision. If an employee refuses to return to work, you offer him his job back and he goes, I don't want it. He still doesn't get the PPD award. The only time he gets the PPD award is when you don't offer him his job back you know, at the same pay. So if he goes, you know, I don't want to come back, um, I just don't feel like it. Well, the P, again, that PPD will be deferred and reduced on a weekly basis until it goes down to zero each week that he or she refuses to come back to work. As I mentioned, this is pretty monumental change. I don't believe any other state does this. And if it stays, your PPD costs will, you know, it will go down like this. I mean, it's going to be substantial savings to the employer and the insurance carriers. It will probably be challenged to the Supreme Court at some point in time, but you're going to have to actually have somebody that's adversely affected by this to challenge it. You can't just go to the Supreme Court saying, oh, I think this is unconstitutional. Well, there has to be a, a case, which means an ALJ is going to have to say, okay, you, you had surgery, you're entitled to 15% impairment, the employer offers the person their job back, they come back to work and then they go, where's my PPD check? And then they go, well, no, it's being deferred. You don't get it. At that point in time, they may say, okay, I've been adversely affected by this new law. And then they could start challenging that up, up the chain until they get to the Supreme Court. But that's actually going to be a while. So this will be in effect for quite a while until that's actually, A, goes up to the Supreme Court, and B, and the Supreme Court actually hears the case. The second part here, even if that PPD deferral goes away, we still have the reduction in PPD benefits of over 30 percent, and the second part is going, to, is going to result in a lot of reduction in PPD cost too. The permanent impairment ratings must be in accordance with the AMA guides to the evaluation of permanent impairment sixth edition, and we feel these ratings will, will be much more conservative and result in savings. These, when I say sixth edition, it's not like you've had a different edition over the past six years. These things have been around for 50, 60 years or longer. They don't change these impairment rating guides that often. What they do is they, they, look at, they look at surgeries, medical procedures, and they try to determine, okay, if, the, if this person had this type of surgery, what is, their, what is their impairment? And they study cases, and they study outcomes, and they look at statistics. And I think what they feel is that medical procedures have gotten a lot better 
over the past 10 years, there have been a lot of advancements in medical. So now when a person has a surgery, they're less likely to suffer any type of impairment now than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So a lot of times you have a shoulder, shoulder surgery, you come back, you're good as new, you're probably better than new. You actually don't have an impairment. So these things have been taken into account in these new imp imp impairment guides. So just combine that, these conservative ratings with the 30% reduction in PBD, and we're already going to have a big reduction in PBD costs, and then you throw in the PPD deferral, and we're going to have a very substantial reduction in PPD costs. And since PPD was the problem, maybe the workers' compensation rates will eventually start sliding down to a lot closer to Arkansas and Texas. Some injuries that are not compensable under the new law. Um, if a person gets into a fight during the work hours um, and you get hurt, you're not covered under workers' compensation. If you engage in horseplay on the job, you're not covered by workers' compensation. If you're engaged in recreational activities sponsored by the employer it, you're, and you get hurt, say, playing softball, um, it's not covered. I would mention that, that firemen are able actually to exercise and play sports and stuff to stay in shape. Those things are covered under workers' compensation. Um, personal intervening injury that aggravates the workers' comp injury. Say you have a, you do have a legitimate claim, a legitimate shoulder injury, but then you go out there and play on your, on your own time, play football, and you hurt it a lot worse. That's not going to be covered under workers' comp. Um, the, the effects of aging and degeneration of knees, elbows, backs, and necks, this is always a focus on from the legislature to try to get these types of injuries out of the workers' compensation form and put them back towards your, you know, your standard medical. And um, it's tough and, you know, they say that they're not covered, but it's going to be the ALJs are going to be, be the ones that have to eventually decide that, just saying, well, you had that injury because you, you had arthritis. The doctor's going to say, well, this isn't caused by on the job. This is just natural aging procedure. Hopefully the ALJs, and we think they will, will say, we agree with what the doctors are saying, and this is just a, it's not an on-the-job injury. It's just part of getting old. And um, then it'll be covered under a different line of insurance. Um, injuries that occur um, on breaks but that are off-premises, say you go to 7-Eleven or get and go or whatever you have in, in Woodward, and um, you're, you get hurt getting a Coke, that's not covered. However, if you're on the job on your normal break period it's act and you're hurt, it actually is covered, which is kind of, you know, hard to get a hold of. Um, when, where there's presence of illegal alcohol or illegal drugs or pre prescription drugs used in contravention of his directions at the first doctor visit. Somebody goes to the doctor and you have a drug testing policy in force that you've agreed upon as, a, as an organization and they go to the doctor and they take blood and they've, they're on drugs, illegal drugs, or they've been drinking, the workers' compensation claim isn't um, covered. And a lot of times that chases people away from filing workers' compensation claims if they knew that they were, you know, smoking pot or had a beer before breakfast or whatever in an axi, and they know that they're going to get tested and it's uh, agreed upon in, in your um, employee policies that you do have a drug testing policy, they'll, they won't go to the doctor. They'll just stay away. They go, it's not worth it. I don't want to, A, I don't want to get caught doing this stuff because I may get fired, and B, my workers' comp claim is not going to be upheld anyway. The legislature is always trying to do away with parking lot cases, basically saying that if you're hurt in the parking lot, it's not covered under workers' comp insurance, and we saw a lot of those. In February, we had all those ice storms, and people would come to work and slip and fall and get hurt. Um, those are not going to be covered under workers' comp. If it's, if you get there before, if you're on your way to work and just a normal employee, because there's going to be exceptions for people like policemen and firemen because they're driving around doing different things, but a normal person that comes to work and um, slips on their way to the workplace and hurts themselves, they're not going to be covered. Or if they're on their way home and they slip and hurt themselves in the parking lot, that won't be covered. The, the exceptions are for essential job functions or under direction from a supervisor. So if you have tools out in your truck and you have to go out there in the middle of the day to get your tools and then you hurt yourself on the parking lot, it's covered. So it's um, a lot of these cases, if you're hurt on a parking lot, maybe you'll no longer be covered under workers' compensation insurance. However, it's now going to be shifted to like a, a parking lot um, premises claim, another line of insurance. So. 
it's you know, because you didn't maintain your parking lot or you, there was a pothole or you should have iced it down or something like that. So there'll be a lot of cost shifting that goes on. You're taking claims away from the workers' comp forum and you're putting them under a different line of insurance. The Supreme Court will eventually decide what, what the definition is of actually being on the job. These are questions that people have been struggling with in the insurance industry for a long time and adjusters struggle with it. Um, is this covered or is this not covered? Is this an essential function? Is this not an essential function? The Supreme Court will eventually decide, okay, they may say if you're on the per person's premises, you know, you're on the job. They may go, no, you have to actually be inside the building. Then people go, well, what about if you're one foot inside the outside and you're grabbing the door and you fall, is that covered? As you could see, there's a lot of gray error on these claims. Um, changes in fi filing time frames under the new law. Uh, claim for compensation must be filed within one year of date of injury, down from previously of two. Again, we're going back to speeding the process along. Don't wait two years to file a claim. Get it, if, you, if you're hurt, get that claim filed so we can get it resolved. A hearing must be requested within six months of the date of claim. Um, again, let's get this case going. Let's not drag this out for years and years. The claim is barred if the employee receives no medical treatment or benefits within one year of date of injury. And the employee must be on the job for 180 days before being allowed to file for a cumulative trauma injury. So if you just hired a new employee and one month later they're going, you know what, my, um, my wrist hurt from typing too much, it's not covered under the Workers' Compensation Act. They have to be on the job for at least six months before filing for a cumulative trauma case. You guys have probably seen these by now. The new court not employer's notice of injury is called a CC Form 2. And it used to be just called a Form 2 for all claims prior to 2-1, but now you use this form no matter when the injury occurred. And the biggest change is that the commission only wants to know about these injuries if the employer employee has missed more than three days of work, basically becoming eligible for TTD. They don't want to know about these cases if it's medical only or if they only missed one day of work. However, as a third-party administrator for, for an insurance company, we have to know what those cases are. We have, we need to know um, all your medical onlys. We need to know when somebody slips and falls. We have to know right away because there's a positive correlation between how quickly you notify your insurance carrier and their positive outcomes of the claim, the reduction in litigation, getting them their medical treatment they need. So, um, an employer could be fined $500, $500 for failure to submit one of those forms to the commission. However, um, we've talked to the commission about this. We said, well, we're going to tell all of our clients we have to have those Form 2s filed to us for every injury type. And um, we'll pass along to that they, the commission only wants them sent to them if they miss more than three days' time. So that's up to you as an employer. You know, make it confusing because you go, you know, I, I don't know if I actually send it to the commission. The commission has said they're not going to return any claim, any Form 2s that they've received that didn't meet this criteria. So it, again, that's up to you. We need them for all injuries. The commission only wants them when they've missed more than three days lost time. A new form that the commission has created is called a C, uh, CC Form 2A. It is, um, what we're doing as an insurance carrier and the employer is we're telling the injured worker whether we've accepted or denied the claim, whether we've started TTD or whether, we, whether we're not going to do it. The, um, it's a brand new form and we're getting the hang of it. Uh, we'll file the form for the employer. The, the fine for not filing what is on the employer, but we've taken responsibility for filing the form. And if we need to do an extension a time because we, we say we didn't get the notice of injury from you guys within eight days and we needed some time to do some investigation we go we're not going to be able to get an answer out in time we'll file an extension of time to make sure that there's no you know potential fines involved basically we're just in, we're just saying we've accepted the claim or denied the claim but a copy of it gets mailed to the injured worker now we've been doing these presentations now for over a month and the commission's now over you know a little bit over two months old and I have some statistics I'd like to pass on, on that aren't on the slide and actually just one statistic, but it's very important. There, in the first two months of the Commission's existence, there's been 227 um, Form 3s, or the equivalent of a Form 3, which is the employee's claim for compensation filed at the Workers' Compensation Commission for the first two months. Historically, 
These Form 3 filings average about 1,000 filings a month under the old system. So now we're at 110 a month versus 1,000 a month. So um, that's a, we didn't even, nobody anticipated that there would be this much reduction in workers' compensation claims. I think what this is saying is that obviously there's a feeling out period. Everybody doesn't really know what's going on. But I think a lot of the workers' compensation claim filings were, were attorney driven. The claimants' attorneys advertised. They would go, they would say, well, you can get a settlement. You know, they showed up on TV. They were the ones that were taking people that just had a normal injury and saying, well, we could get you a lot more money. The claimants' attorneys, I think, are kind of moving out of the system. They go, well, we, we're not going to be able to beat the ALJs. The PPD awards are going way down. And that's where they would get their money on the, in the past was on those PPD settlements. And um, so they're kind of getting out of the business. So now it looks like the focus is on just if a person's legitimately hurt, let's get them the medical treatment. Let's get this case resolved as quickly as possible so that they could get back to work and to get the best treatment possible. And it looks like it's working, at least anecdotally, for the, fir for the first two months. So um, don't over overemphasize the new law. You know, just let them know that um, we'll get you your medical treatment, get, the, get your TPA notified as quickly as possible, take care of your, your injured worker. And I, we really think that there's going to be a big reduction in workers' compensation costs. Um, as I mentioned, I'll wrap up real quickly. I was the director of insurance regulating self-insured employers. And uh, Pam will talk about these things in more detail. But I asked, uh, the self-insured employers historically average about a 60% loss ratio, which is, you know, that means that their workers' compensation costs were a lot more in line with Arkansas and Texas and the region than the standard insured was. I asked them, okay, well, what do you do to c control your workers' compensation costs? And invariably, these things pop up. They focus on safety. They try to prevent the injury from happening in the first place. The communication between the injured worker, the supervisors, the, um, the, the safety people, everybody knew what their roles were. So if somebody was hurt, they didn't panic and go, I don't know what to do. Um, I'm going to go hire an attorney because they're the only person that cares. They knew exactly what to do. The supervisors knew what to do. The, um, that helps. Um, they tried to screen the employees, you know, from make sure that somebody didn't um, have a use a false name and on their application, and then under the false name, they might have had multiple workers' compensation injuries, so they lied on their application. They tried to keep those people out. They investigate the claim so they could a help the adjuster and note in knowing whether it was going to going to be a um, a false claim if there was questionable circumstances. They, they have a very robust light duty return to work program so that people don't stay on TTD. If they're able to come back and do something, they, they bring them back and have them do something. Um, they treated their injured workers with compassion. And um, you'd be surprised at how often that actually works. You know, a lot of times people get hurt on the job and the employer's mad. They go, well, that person's faking it. But if, even if you don't even mean it, treat them with compassion. Um, let them know that you'll get their medical treatment taken care of and treat them with respect and you'll probably keep them from hiring an attorney and be diligent. You don't really know when your next workers' compensation injury is going to um, take effect, is going to occur. So even though we have a new law that, that um, is going to reduce workers' compensation costs and litigation a lot, still be diligent. Just try to do all these things and follow Pam's advice that she's going to give you coming up and you should be good on your workers' compensation costs. So 